were out at the range with a 5.56 can set up to take direct thread attachment. And the reason we're out here is because we're gonna do potentially destructive testing. What we wanna show you guys today is what you might expect from a direct thread silencer on a 5.56 rifle should it start to back off. Now, inevitably in my experience, no matter how hard you try, a simple direct thread silencer will start to back off the threads no matter what you do. We've tried strap wrenching them on and lock tightening them and everything. Ultimately, physics win, and I don't understand the physics of it, but the can will start to walk itself off the end of your barrel. That's why they offer different mounting solutions through different manufacturers. In this case, we're using a KG made silencer from our friends over at Big Daddy Unlimited. They sent us the suppressor for what is potentially destructive testing this afternoon. We like to thank them for sending it out. Uh, the KG made silencer that we have here is set up to take Silencer Co attachments. And so we've chosen to put a direct thread attachment on it. But if you do have a KG made silencer like this one, you can use different attachments like taper mounts and things like that. So you don't have to use it. That's just what we've chosen to do. We've put some witness marks on here so we know how many revolutions we've backed the can off for the purposes of testing this afternoon. I also just wanna quickly show you some of the alternative mounting solutions out there that will keep your silencer from backing off the end of your barrel. Now, while the silencer is prone to backing off, muzzle devices that are properly attached aren't. Don't ask me why, but they aren't. So that's why companies have come up with things like this muzzle device on this YHM turbo suppressor. It has a ratcheting locking system. So as you tighten the silencer down, it clicks and with each click, it becomes tighter and it simply will not back off the end of your barrel. Another alternative, something that I use quite often, is what Griffin Armament is using on this 6.5 Explorer can, which is a new product from them specifically for 6.5 caliber firearms. This one uses a taper mount. So if you take a look at the muzzle device, you have your threads here, and then there's a shoulder at an angle. And this increases the surface area, so when you tighten the can, just hand tighten it against the face of that taper, it will draw the can up and hold it very snugly against the muzzle device, and it will not back off with use, thus preserving your point of impact and potentially your accuracy. That's what we're gonna find out here this afternoon. Really quickly, the ammunition that we're going to use is from our friends over at Federal. They do give us the ammunition to use here on the Military Arms Channel for testing. This is just some generic bulk pack 223, 55 grain ball. And again, we'd like to thank them for sending that. The rifle we're going to use really quickly is a Falcor Defense Caitlin. We do have the Falcor Defense lower off and we came out to zero the one to eight power uh, Trigicon optic that we have on here right now, uh, we noticed that the Geisley trigger was having hammer follow issues. And so we had another AR lower in Peaches over there, grabbed it, stuck it on here. It's a BCI lower. We'll resolve the issues with the Geisley trigger when we get back to the shop. But um, yeah, so that's our test bed. Uh, Caitlin, Trigicon, BCI lower, and half by 28 threads on the end of the barrel. I'm going to go ahead and thread the KG made can on, and we're gonna do some testing to kick this testing off, and that will be a decibel meter. We're gonna put the rifle on the decibel meter with the KG made silencer on and properly seated. Just snug them, that's all you have to do. And we're gonna get some meter readings using the, the uh, 55 grain ball. And then should we get a baffle strike or some sort of failure with the can other than a catastrophic failure, uh, if we get a baffle strike or something that we see, we'll go back over and meter it again to see if that changes the decibels, either you know makes it louder or makes it more quiet or just doesn't change a darn thing. And we'll find out uh, should that happen. So I think that's pretty much everything. Now let's head over to the, seat, to the uh, pressure sensor and do the quick testing to get a baseline for how loud this can is this afternoon. It's about 75, 76 degrees. Now we're gonna perform a really quick decibel meter test with the rifle as set up. We're using the 55 grain uh, Federal bulk pack ammunition, 223. Go ahead and set up the sound meter. Now we are 1.6 meters off the ground, one meter left. One thirty nine point eight, one 
139.1 and 140.8. All right, so let's go ahead and stop that. And now let's head over and start our testing of backing the suppressor off, starting off at a quarter turn at a time and see what happens to our groups. Okay, silence are still nice and snug. So now let's go ahead and proceed with our first group. A lot of you guys ask me what the bag is that I'm using. Uh, this is Coltec. Check them out. Very, very strong Second Amendment advocates. I burned the bag with a hot suppressor a while ago, which you can see there, <laughs> but it's still holding up. I have to get myself another bag here one of these days. All right, but I love shooting off these soft bags. All right, got our five shot group. Let's run down range, use ballistics on the iPhone, get a group size, and then we'll back this can off a quarter turn and see what happens. So ballistics tells us that the group size is 0.97 of an inch. So right at one inch at 50 yards. Jason called out a mistake I almost made. I double marked the initial zero. This is with the can tight. So otherwise we wouldn't be able to distinguish the different marks from each other. So now we know where zero is, if you will. All right, so let's go ahead and back that can off one quarter of a turn and see what that does to our accuracy. All right, so there's one quarter of a turn. You can see that's where zero was and we've backed it off one quarter. Let's shoot another group. And let's also see, once it's loose now, how much it starts to walk. Okay, I should be able to tell those holes apart. Weapon is safe, let's run down range. First of all, let's see, it doesn't look like it turned anymore in five rounds. So you can see there's where our starting point is and that's where we set it. But usually it takes quite a few rounds to start that can walking off. It's not something you're going to accomplish in five rounds. All right, let's go see what we got in terms of a group size and we'll just keep backing it off. So what we've learned is with one quarter turn loose, the point of impact shifted center to center on those groups about two inches at 50 yards. That's not insignificant. At 500 yards, you're no longer on the target if you're talking about a man-sized target. So that's a huge shift in point of impact just by turning the can one quarter of a turn out of being tight. So let's go ahead and turn it to the half position right there. So now we've only backed it off half a turn and see if that changes anything yet again. All right, so five more rounds. Oh, it's interesting to note as well that the group size doesn't appear to have really opened up at all. It just shifted down about two inches and a little bit to the left. That's insane. I think the group stayed in the same spot, but actually got tighter. It's kind of hard to see from here with these old eyes, so we'll go down and take a look. So what's interesting is in the third group that we shot, the point of impact didn't shift anymore. The group is actually, again, still very, about the same 
respectable for ball ammunition. And um, so we're gonna go ahead and back it off one full turn now so we're not just doing this incrementally. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring this all the way around. So now we're one full turn loose. Let's see if that makes a difference. And from here on out, we're just gonna go one full turn until we start to see signs of things going wrong potentially. All right, we have five more rounds. Now what I will say is I've tested firearms that had threads that were not concentric to bore and we had wild shot dispersion. At 50 yards, it was like five or six feet with a nine millimeter in one case. I've also, with my Scorpion, which has a direct thread uh, can on it, uh, when that can's come just a little bit loose, again, at 50 yards, I noticed a very big point of impact shift where tight, I was hitting bowling pins at 50 yards, quarter turn loose, I couldn't hit a bowling pin at 50 yards. So now we're doing it with a 5.56. All right, let's, uh, just to see what the 5.56 does. One full turn loose at 50 yards with the Federal 223. Again, it looks like it's putting them right in there, just two inches low from the first group. So at one full revolution, we're still shooting just two inches low, but it's still grouping quite nicely, which is actually pretty impressive. Now, I'll have to go back and review the video. I may not have been very precise, but it looks like perhaps this started to walk just a little bit. I wanna say that it was there, and after five rounds, we were there. But I have to take a look at the video. I wasn't trying to be that precise. I just noticed it wasn't in alignment with my witness mark there. So I'm gonna go ahead and make one full revolution loose again. And now the can visibly wobbles. How oh, that thing's still hot. <laughs> you can see the can visibly wobbles when I move it, when I push on the end of it. This is where we're gonna get into baffle strike territory. If you take a look here, you can see at two revolutions, how much space we have between the end of the barrel, which is the right angle the can needs to butt up against for um, for that point of impact to remain the same. All right, so two full revolutions. Let's see if that causes shot dispersion anyway, or let's see if that is enough wobble in the can. Keep in mind, most of these silencer manufacturers purposely give a little bit of play in there so the baffle isn't just touching that round. There's a little bit of play, so if something does go wrong, like it backs off, that it's giving you some margin of error so you don't get a baffle strike. But this movement might be enough to actually cause perhaps an end cap strike. Let's strike. Let's see. All right. Another five rounds, two revolutions. <clears throat> now, if I see any odd keyholing or anything out down there like that, I'm going to go ahead and stop shooting. That is truly crazy, guys. So it's still stacking the rounds in the exact same spot, just two inches low from tight. That I actually didn't expect. So this is the first time I've purposely set about to try to see how far I could back a can off before something bad happened. We're gonna let the can cool off. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at the end of the can, but there is no evidence whatsoever downrange that I'm getting anywhere near a baffle strike. So it's really impressive, guys, that at two full revolutions that we haven't seen the shot dispersion open up at all. We've just seen the slight point of impact shift. Now with that last group that I fired with two revolutions, it looks like that group shifted down just a little bit, maybe a half of an inch, but um, no signs. The bolt is locked open, the weapon is unsafe. And just taking a look at the end of the suppressor, I do not see any signs of a baffle strike. And I certainly don't see any signs of it downrange. Probably the first clue to a baffle strike would be a wild shot or a keyholing shot. And then we'd stop and take a look at the end of the suppressor. So let's resume our testing. First of all, let's back it off to three. I almost forgot to back it off. So we'll go to three revolutions off. All right, I pretty much perfectly lined that up so we can see if it moves at all in five shots now. 
that wobble is significant, but there still might be enough play in this can to keep it from damaging it, which is a good design characteristic of the KG Made silencer. Okay, through the scope I can see again, we had one shot that dropped down below the other, so it looks like as we back it off, we're starting to see that group ever so slightly shift downwards. The weapon is safe, magazine's out, bolts locked to the rear, it is unsafe. And again, I don't see any deformation. All right, so once again, I took a quick picture. It just looks like we had a couple of shots drop down just a little bit further. So now we're three revolutions off from being fully seated. Jason says, screw it, go for two, because we don't want to make this video last all day long. But you can see that the can, with those five shots, started to turn to the right. Wouldn't it be nice if these things tightened themselves versus loosening themselves? All right, so we're gonna go two full revolutions for a total of five, we're at three now. I gotta keep that straight in my head. One, two. All right, Jason, if this blows my face off, Really, the, I mean, yeah, there's some wobble there. I, can't, I don't know if the wobble's getting worse. There's quite a bit of thread on the end of this barrel. All right, here we go. <laughs> I brought out the full face shield. I think I got five rounds loaded. All right, let's see what happens with five revolutions. This is getting a bit ridiculous. Hopefully you would notice it by now. Get all my body parts back. <laughs> All right, I saw a lot of grass fly. All right, I see holes way low. I'm gonna stop shooting. All right, so I saw a lot of grass fly on that first shot, the second shot, which tells me the rounds are burrowing in low. And I just saw through the scope, there's definitely one round low. All right, so we're gonna stop there and see if we got a baffle strike. So we're down range at 50 yards. We fired two rounds, only one of the two rounds connected. Both times I saw grass fly, which told me that the rounds were in fact hitting low. Only one round connected, and that's the round right down here. Point of aim, original point of impact, just a little bit high. You can see as we started to unscrew the can, the group pretty much, it'd be hard to say it really shifted down much at three revolutions. They're all impacting right in there. We saw a couple rounds drop, and then we went to five, and now we've definitely, well, I should say we haven't looked. We probably have a baffle strike or an end cap strike. Let's go back and take a look and see what we have. So at five revolutions, we definitely got an end cap strike. Now I will say guys, you really should be paying attention to your weapon when you're out using it, especially if you're using a direct thread can. I can just move this rifle. I can tell there's something loose on the end of my barrel. And that is true even at two revolutions uh, of being backed off. So you should notice that. And if you don't, shame on you if you're running a direct thread can. All right, so let's go ahead and unscrew it. Five revolutions loose. You can see how far off that was. It was a long ways off being snug. And you can see again how we have quite a bit of thread there left. All right, now let's take a look at the end. And that is what an end cap strike looks like. So now the question is, we have an end cap strike. Will the gun go back to zero and still shoot a group if I snug it back up? Let's find out. Now the rounds did not keyhole, but the shot dispersion went wild. We saw one round hit way low and one round didn't even hit the man-sized target at 50 yards. Okay, we're back to being tight. Let's see if our group goes back to being just a little bit high and right of center with our first group that we shot as a baseline.
from what I can see here, we went back to pretty much where that first group was when we tested, we started the testing, I should say. And it looks like the accuracy is about the same. So we didn't affect the point of impact when it was retightened. And it doesn't look like we have had a negative effect on the overall accuracy. Let's run down range and get a closer look. I'll get a picture of it so I can show you guys. All right, that's 10. 11, 12, 13, we're almost at the end of the threads. Let's see where that is. 14 is off, so there's no way we're gonna to get to 15. So let's go one revolution on, two revolutions on, and if Jason wants to see any more than that, he's pulling the trigger. <laughs> I had that safety on, I'm like, <laughs> when Eric does crazy stuff like this, he's wearing a ballistic suit and a welder's mask. I hope I don't learn the hard way as to why that is. All right, here we go. This is barely dangling on the end of the barrel. Do not do this at home. I'm going to aim purposely really low. All right. I could see the, the can's actually hanging, drooping. And once again, because I use that witness mark, it hits in the exact same spot. Guys, if we turn this anymore, the can's gonna fall off the end of the gun. That's pretty darn interesting. I'm gonna tighten her back up. And our last test will be to shoot a group. We backed this silencer off as far as we could and just left it with a couple of threads of engagement and that can was visibly drooping on the end of the barrel. We got a major end cap strike and you can tell it's right on top. That's because that can is drooping on the end of the barrel. It makes sense that impact would be right at the very top there of the suppressor. All right, so now we've tightened everything back up again and we're just gonna shoot now that we have a serious baffle strike. Let's take a look at what the accuracy and or point of impact is after that baffle strike. <laughs> Four rounds touching and one low. <laughs> so does it negatively affect the accuracy? Not in the slightest, not at all. Just to make sure, we're firing three rounds of the exact same ammunition for the exact same gun to see if we get any change in the meter data. Go ahead and reset that because that's 113 decibels, the bolt closing. One thirty seven point nine. 138.2. One thirty six point six. So no change in the performance on the sound meter with the baffle strike. We certainly got some interesting data points this afternoon. I know I learned something by conducting this test. So keep in mind with a different firearm, a different silencer, perhaps even different ammunition, we may see a different result. But here's what we learned with the can snug. We shot for groups, got a baseline, turned the can a quarter of a turn and that's when the point of impact shifted measurably two inches at 50 yards, a little bit left and down. We kept back, backing the can off to what I consider a ridiculous point, and yet the groups never opened up. It just stayed low and pretty much center until we reached that point of being utterly ridiculous and we actually got a, uh, an end cap strike and perhaps a baffle strike inside of the can. We can't take it apart, it's welded and sealed, but we may have gotten a baffle strike, we definitely got an end cap strike. And that's when shots went wild. 
and we started missing the target at 50 yards. So it was pretty interesting. And what I also found really interesting was that we just had this can hanging on by a couple of threads and still we did not have a catastrophic failure with the setup that we have out here this afternoon. Keep in mind, as I said earlier, things may change depending on the rifle, the can, and other variables. So don't think that just because we did it here, you're gonna get the same results, and please don't do this type of testing on your own. So for me, it kind of confirms what I've always believed and something that I've always done, and that's just simply use a taper mount. On my hunting rifles, I like taper mounts because it keeps that can snug. If I'm out in the field walking around and my can comes just barely loose, I can see a point of impact, in the case of this rifle, by up to two inches at 50 yards. I took my last animal on my last hunt at nearly 200 yards. I would have missed the animal if my can were just slightly loose on the end of the barrel. So that's something for you guys to consider. If you'd like to see more content like this, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. We are viewer funded. There is a link down below. Click that link to Patreon and consider joining us in our Patreon family and supporting us in our mission to bring you guys content like this. Also, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. And last but not least, we are Twitch gamers. If you'd like to join us on a stream, become a Patreon supporter, shoot us your PSN network name, we'll add you as a friend, and you can join us in a live stream. Guys, thanks for 11 years of support, and we'll talk to you guys soon.